Hello everyone, T.A. Barron here. Welcome back to my writing room. All these magical objects that you see around you here have been given to me by readers and imaginers, creators of their own stories and fans of mine from all around the world. So every time I sit down here at my writing desk, whether to work on a brand new manuscript like you see happening here, or indeed the Merlin movie script from Disney, or anything else, I'm surrounded by the sheer love of story, uh, which is something that I also carry around with me every day. I wear this wonderful amulet that was given to me by the leader of a clan of druids who walked all the way to Frankfurt, Germany from the forests of Bavaria where he lives in order to thank me for bringing the voice of Merlin into this time in the world. Of course, when he gave me this and, and I looked at that gorgeous beautiful, beautiful image of a spreading oak tree. I said, you give me way too much credit, way too much, because Merlin is very much here, very much here without me. I just happen to be the latest person to sing his song in a vast chorus of people all around the world. He said, nevertheless, I want you to have this and always remember that those who read your stories and appreciate what you are doing will be there with you, even when we are very far away. And stories are like that, you know? Stories travel across boundaries of all kinds. They leap across the walls of language and distance and culture and, and time even. All of those barriers just disappear when it's a good story because it just connects all of us human beings in our hearts. So. With that spirit, that's how I sit at my writing desk when I'm writing here. And now I welcome you here to read the next chapter in Tree Girl. Here we are. Are you ready for chapter eight? Let's do it. Romping with the bear didn't seem odd at all to Anna, any more than playing with Eagle or Old Master Burl. And with Sasha Rash, she had someone just as eager as she was to climb a tree or splash around in a tide pool or stuff herself with fat, juicy raspberries. The days stretched into summer and lengthened like the golden grass at the glade. And during those days, Anna saw plenty of her new companion. But first, every morning, she scurried around to finish all her chores. She tended her vegetables, sharpened the old axe, chopped some more driftwood, banked the fire coals, and mixed some batter for kelp biscuits, turnip cakes, or whatever she planned for that evening's supper. More than ever, she wanted to keep the master content. I must, Eagle, she'd tell the bird on her shoulder, so everything will go on just as it is. When at last her chores were done, she would join the cub and romp all afternoon. Together they climbed every tree near the cottage, waded in the shallows, stacked up huge towers of starfish, pretended they were clouds sailing high overhead, and found every last hiding place along the shore. Once Sasharash led her to the spot where the stream gushed out of the trees and across the beach. Then for a very long time, he sat motionless at the edge of the bank, as still as a turtle resting on a rock except he was no turtle, and this was no rock. Anna got impatient. Crab claws, Sash, what are you doing? The bear didn't answer, didn't move, not even to lick the river fly crawling on his nose. Suddenly, he sprang. His paw slapped the water and swatted a perch as big as Anna's forearm out of the stream. The fish smacked the bank, spraying water and mud all over the bear but he only roared in glee, the perfect lunch. Anna watched him take his first great bite. The bear tore off a piece of the tail and tossed it over to her. Er, no thanks, she said. I like my fish cooked. The cub wrinkled his nose in disgust, then went back to his meal. At the end of each day, 
their games always stopped in time for Anna to make the master's supper. Not that Sasharash didn't growl and stop his, pros, his paws in protest, of course. In time, though, he always let her go. She had plenty to do, including a run around the beach to wipe away any bear prints so the old man wouldn't find them. True enough, sometimes she had to work very fast before his boat landed. And true enough, she hardly had time now to climb Burl and wait just to catch a glimpse of the high willow. But she didn't mind. For now, she had a friend. No, not that she dared to breathe a word of that to her master or to show just how happy she felt. He would never understand. And besides, with summer's longer days, he stayed out later to fish. So while he still eyed her carefully every evening, and she still wondered if he suspected something, he was too tired to say much beyond grunts and curses. There came an afternoon when Anna and the cub rested by the glade. She chewed on a sprig of mint and leaned back against a boulder, splattered with orange lichen. I understand your words pretty well now, Sash, don't you think? The bear, lying on top of the boulder, didn't answer. He was too busy scratching his backside on the stone. He wriggled and twisted like a giant fur-covered worm. Don't you? she repeated. The bear just wriggled some more, then reached down with one of his paws and tickled the tail feathers of the sparrow on her shoulder. Eagle shrieked and flapped his good wing. Anna tried again. Come now, answer me. Finally, the, club, the cub replied. As always, he spoke in low, swishing tones. And as always, Anna understood without knowing how. Hmm, you've learned fast enough. The bear rolled over on his chest and batted at a white mouth. Then he growled. But you should let me take you deeper into the forest. More to do there and more to eat, too. Anna's mint leaf suddenly lost its flavor. She spat it on the ground. Oh, Sash, you make it sound so easy. It is easy. No, it's not. I've been longing forever to do that, to go right up to the other side of the forest and up the ridge all the way to the high willow. She sighed. Did I tell you the master found me there? The cub made a growl that was closer to a groan. Three times already. Right there among the roots, she went on dreamily. And someday, well, someday I'm going back. Sure as seafoam I am. Her chest heaved in a sigh. <sighs> it's what I want most, Sash, more than anything. The bear just shrugged. Why do you care so much where you came from? It's just the place. Oh, no! It's much more than that. It's my place, my beginning. Seeing it will help me see myself, who I really am. He snorted. You don't know that already? No. Her eyes clouded. I don't. With his tongue, he licked the very tip of his nose. Whatever you think about that place, it doesn't matter. You'll never go back there. Anna sat up so sharply that the sparrow nearly tumbled off her shoulder. What do you mean by that? Sash stretched out his paw to a gorseberry bush beside the boulder. He growled in concentration, aimed carefully, then swatted one plump berry clean off its stem. The berry sailed high into the air. Meanwhile, the cub swung himself around and opened his jaws just in time to catch the flying treat on his tongue. He swallowed and smacked his lips. Tell me, said Anna with a growl of her own. Tell you what? Rotting ravens, Sash. Why you said I'm not going up there? The cub eyed her darkly. If you won't let me take you any deeper into the forest, how can you ever get to the high willow? She frowned. I don't know. She lowered her voice, unsure who might be listening in the trees beyond the glade. Even the old beach, friendly as it seemed on the surface, might be hiding something else. It's, it's the ghouls. 
I'm not ready to face them. Why are you whispering? She just bit her lip. Sash thumped her shoulder with his paw. Anna, listen to me. Listen. There are no forest ghouls. She scoffed. Ha! You're joking. Me? Joke? The bear turned his attention to trying to curl his tongue all the way around his longest claw. Suddenly he poked himself, yelped, and shook his tongue hard for several seconds. Then he turned back to Anna. I never joke. She smirked at him. Not about that, anyway. He growled deeply. No ghouls here, just trees and whatever creatures live in them. But I've heard stories, lots of them. Sash gave a snort, more like a wild boar than a cub. From who? Master Mean Face himself? Not now. Anna's brow furrowed. Please don't talk about him that way. He could be a sour old turnip. I grant you that, but he wouldn't lie. Well, then, he's got barnacles for brains, Anna. And so do you if you listen to him. He sat up on the boulder, his fur rippling in the sun's rays. Here, I'll prove it to you. Shoulders tense and eyes alert, he scanned the surrounding trees. Suddenly, he spotted the upright trunk of a tree killed by lightning and grunted gladly. Anna shook her head. Surely he wasn't going to climb that old thing. Its slippery smooth trunk with no bark or branches would be impossible. And besides, what did that have to do with ghouls? All at once, the bear leaped off the boulder. He wrapped his legs around the charred trunk and began to work his way upward. As he gouged the claws of his forepaws into the wood, his hind legs groped for a knot to hold his weight. Bit by bit, he edged higher. Thundering thumbnails, Sash, what are you doing? He just kept on climbing. When he reached halfway, more than twice Anna's height off the ground, he came to a stubby bit of branch. But as soon as he grasped it with his paw, the stub broke off. Sash lost his grip and slid most of the way back down, his claws scraping the trunk. With a fierce growl, he started up again, faster than before. By the time he passed the broken stub, chips of wood dotted his snout and clung to his ears. The muscles of his shoulders shook from the strain. Anna watched, her heart thumping along with him. Somehow, beneath his furry coating, he seemed not so much a bear as a person just like herself, almost a boy. Whatever you're doing, Sash, she thought, don't fall, please don't fall. Higher he climbed, and higher. Now he was nearly four times as tall as Anna. She glimpsed some berries up at the top of the trunk. A wreath of lyre berries, round and ripe. Was that what that, this was all about? Now the top was almost in reach. With one last heave, his paw caught the rim. The trunk must have been hollow since he reached right down inside. At last, he hauled himself up to the top, straightened his back, and roared in triumph. Sure enough, Sash grabbed a great pawful of berries and crammed them into his mouth. Yellow juice dribbled down his furry neck. Then he stood up on his hind legs and balanced on the rim. Careful now, Anna called up to him. You'd squash like one of those berries if you fell from there. The cub ignored her, and started to jump on the rim. Look here, all you ghouls, he cried. Come and get me if you can. Anna sucked in her breath. Anxiously, she looked into the dark mass of branches beyond the glade. Don't be foolish, Sash. The bear didn't seem to hear. Watch this, you stupid ghouls, my newest dance step. He kicked one leg outward, balancing on just one paw. Anna chewed her, chewed her lip as she watched. The next instant, he leaped into the air and did a full turn. His body spun around in a sand-colored blur. With a wild cry, he landed safely again on the rim. All of a sudden, a chunk of wood beneath him broke off. Sasha's cry rose to a shriek. His claws raked the air as he toppled backward, right into the hollow trunk. There came another cry, this one muffled and a powerful thud rocked the whole tree. Then, silence.